there we go. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to our talk about the missing pieces in securing your SDLC. I'm Kyle Swero, and you can find me at Hacker Kyle on most things. And I'm Brian Clark, uh, and you can find me at underscore Clark IO or Clark EO, if you will, on most things as well. Awesome. So let's get to it. So I'm a senior security advocate at Sneak, and before that, I was an AppSec engineer at multiple, um, you know, San Francisco-based startups. I um, was a consultant before that, and here are my links. And I'm Brian Clark. I'm also a developer advocate at Sneak. Uh, prior to that, I was working as an architect at Disney and then developer advocacy at Microsoft as well. Um, my focus area is on web development with JavaScript and Node.js. And uh, I have a strong passion for security, which I'm excited to be talking with you all about today to help you, you know, level up your knowledge a, a bit on, on this stuff and some of the tools that can help you actually. So you don't even need to worry about it as much. Awesome. So the whole point of all of this is to, you know, develop fast and stay secure, automate things as much as you can. And, um, you know, that's really what we're about here at Sneak. We fully bought into the whole DevSecOps idea, making, um, you know, security developer centric, making it easy and, um, you know, making it seamless so it can be a part of your um, development process rather than an afterthought. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the agenda and we're going to talk about these three components for the most part we're going to talk about SCA, which is software composition analysis you can think of this as all of your third-party code stuff that you have not written libraries anything you depend on and um, we're going to talk about SAS, which is all your team's code you know your novel business logic all the stuff written in-house the things that you write around these open source packages and these inclusions and these dependencies that you know actually do the novel thing that you're trying to do and then containers and IAC, right? So um, application network, server configuration, all that stuff, it's all code now, right? So developers are usually writing it or people who are developer adjacent, such as CICD engineers, DevOps engineers, et cetera, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, IAC engineers, um, infrastructure network security folks, they're all writing code basically. So shift left is not enough because we have, um, you know, so, so many people writing code. And if we think about it, the the development process has changed a lot, right? We're more agile. People are um, deploying and integrating code more frequently. So instead of you know a few times a year, quarterly releases or whatever, right? We're doing waterfall mode. Development happens like seven several times a day, and um, you know this has to also come with a sh shift in culture, right? Towards a DevSecOps mindset. So you know this is the software development cycle, right? You you plan, you code, you build, you test, you release, you deploy, and then you got to monitor it, right? Because stuff changes, new vulnerabilities are released, as we all know. Um, old libraries can have a new vulnerability pop up, you know, instantly. So um, a lot of folks do actually agree that developers should own security but aren't well equipped to do it, right? So that sounds like a failing on the security team's part, right? We need to empower, you know, myself as a security ex security engineer, right? Um, we need to empower developers better. We need to understand what developers want. And, um, you know, a lot of people feel that security is a huge constraint on the ability to deliver software, right? So it's slowing down this cycle that we see here. So how do we stop that? Well, we need to catch vulns earlier, right? You shouldn't be ready to release code and then start finding all your vulns at the end, right? With a security review or something like that, right? We should plan, you know, with security education, we should be able to plan for secure features, right? We should be able to take that feature, break it down to its fundamental parts, understand the security implications. And then based off of that, you know, that's how we're going to, um, define our approach for building this feature, right? White box testing, right? Somebody knows your code and they're performing a security assessment. So they have access to the full source code, you know, they know all about it. And, um, you know, this could be somebody on your team uh, as a developer, this could be a security engineer from another team and uh, black box testing, right? Somebody throwing stuff at it, seeing what sticks. You don't have um, access to the code that, you know, around build time when you push some code and you've built it, like, yeah, you would start doing some black box testing and, you know, see what you can do with it. SAS and SCAL should happen a little bit before that. You're, to, you're analyzing your code, you're analyzing your packages. So as you're building, SCAL should, and SAS should happen, you know, SCAL should happen on commit. And, um, you know, you can do some really great quality gates here, right? Automatically update um, packages, et cetera. So um, then we, you know, get into vulnerability assessments and pen testing. We get into dynamic stuff, which we're going to stay away from today. That's a whole other topic in and of itself. And then VMs and pen testing. So the further left we shift, the least costly it is to fix things. So the modern application, um, obviously, that um, that brings new risks with it, right? We're talking about changing the paradigm of the way that we've done work. So the code that makes up an application has changed. And basically, you know, we can see this iceberg here, right? We have the code that we are writing, right? The code that we're writing in-house, our business logic. We have open source, right? The code that we're not writing, 80 to 90% of the code base for a lot of projects is open source. 
And 80% um, of vulnerabilities are found in indirect dependencies, right? So as you go down that chain, right, there are more and more obfuscated risks that we're unaware of. And then containers, right? It, that's what it's all running on. And then infrastructure as code, right? Sort of the pipes, you know, putting the plumbing together. So, um, you know, it's gotten really complex and everybody's writing code, no matter what your role is. If you're infrastructure or security, like you're probably writing code. So where can developers get um, you know, automated feedback. Where, how can we developer feed? Uh, de sorry, how can we enable developer feedback with automation? So, um, I think these are, you know, some core questions for, you know, building a good security team, a healthy security team. Um, what you want to do is, right, when people are merging code, you want to check for vulnerabilities. When you can automatically fix things with PRs, right, and uh, that's a little bit that our tool and other tools do, right. You can automatically fix things with PRs. It'll detect old versions with vulnerabilities of software, and then it will. Um, recommend like remediative action and then when you build right you'll find more vulnerabilities you'll probably do sas here right when you're when you're doing something on a build um depending on how your sas you know looks like if you're if you're limiting it right you're probably gonna do it on builds otherwise you do it on every push and then you have a equality gate here right whatever that is maybe some of this stuff fails right maybe you don't want to push this out it's um too risky and then you should be able to get automated, you know, tickets or alerts in Slack or something or PagerDuty when a new vulnerability is discovered. So, um, you know, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the production detection too. But first, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Brian here, and he's going to talk us through SCA and what that is, what it means, how to do it, and why it's important. Yes, and thank you, Kyle. That was wonderful. SCA is not just a music genre. It is software composition analysis. So for us as developers, we tend to focus a lot, and even if we're thinking a little bit about security, our focus is on the code that we write, the novel code that Kyle was referring to earlier. But the reality of that is that's just a small piece of the security space, the surface area of our code that runs our application. Beyond that, it's actually more of this bigger circle around your code. You know, and of course, your code is not just two lines of code. There's more to it there. But the scale of this, you'll see the difference here. And in particular, this is code that's for a Node.js application. But when you're using packages like NPM packages in there, that actually, like, I want vis you visually to think about this, that 80 to 90% from that stat on the slide earlier that Kyle was showing is typically what your whole application consists of, but that are relying on dependencies, open source libraries, or just third-party dependencies. And so like, that's a lot of lines of code that you don't find yourself accountable for. But and the reality is you're, you're just choosing to pull that into your project and it's adding to the surface area of potential areas that can have vulnerabilities in it. So how that's like a daunting task as a developer, one to realize that, especially when you see a lot of the, the ecosystems that are out there with NPM, uh, how many packages there are and things are growing, the more packages that come up, the more vulnerabilities that are possible as a result of that. So here is not just highlighting NPM as time goes on uh, from a study that was done and research that was done by Sneak, but other package ecosystems as well. So you got PHP, Maven, Golang, PyPI. Um, you know, as time goes on, more packages are created, more potential vulnerabilities are being realized over that time frame. In addition to that, one of the things is you might be thinking, okay, I have my direct dependencies that I'm worried about, and I didn't realize that that consists, that creates 80 to 90% of my lines of code that support my application. But in addition to that, those dependencies might depend upon other dependencies and so on and so forth, all the way down this long tree. How do you manage that? And what Sneak has found through some research is that uh, a lot of issues and vulnerabilities come up through indirect dependencies or transitive dependencies which you don't even, you know, you didn't choose to include those. You chose to include, include the parent library that is depending on those other ones. So what do you do then, right? That's even more of a pain, more of a headache to be worrying about and something to stress about as a developer to make sure your security is as best as it can possibly be. Uh, next slide there, Kyle. So, and again, to further drive home the, the breadth of all this, right? This is, this is looking at all the different, like a lot of highlighting a lot of the big, NPM packages that are out there and the things that are depending upon that, right? So you think, all right, that's, that's wild. That's a lot right there. But if you think about all the projects that depend on these things, there's somebody uh, on Vaca, a GitHub user that created this a galaxy that Kyle and I were checking out when we were doing some research and preparing for this talk, 
we came across this and I highly recommend folks go check that out. The link is shared at the bottom of the image there. You can actually, it's three dimensional. You can fly through it and explore all the different projects and their dependencies. And, and it's, it's just wild and massive how many things are out there that are interconnected and depending upon each other in the entire ecosystem. And that's just, that's just NPM. That's just, you know, like node and web development type of projects in that ecosystem, let alone what the other ecosystems might be like. And you add that into the mix, right? And you might have that as your back end and maybe your front end is more JavaScript dependencies with NPM. So you're put, pulling in two different ecosystems with dependencies that you have to worry about security vulnerabilities in. I highly recommend we got stuck in like exploring and flying through that galaxy. And I highly recommend folks go check that out to get to get a feeling more of a feeling of what this is about. So with that said, uh, next slide there, Kyle. Enough of the talking. Let's let's demo. I want you all to one of the things that I've learned as a developer uh, that helped grow my interest in security is being able to see exactly what it is that I need to defend against. There's lots of terms that folks that are highly knowledgeable in the security space that are sharing and trying to educate us as developers on they, they like things like cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery and other types of uh, issues that come up that we need to learn about as developers. But those are all like terms and they are, you know, can be explained very well by the security folks and other developers as well. But seeing what it is, right, getting, getting a feel for what it is that you have to defend against is really what helped things click for me. And I think it would be super helpful for you all to come to realization and understand things better. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put our hacker hats on. Imagine I have my hoodie over here, but it's, it's kind of hot in here. I'm in Florida. Uh, we put your hacker hats on and we're going to check out what it's like to uh, run a vulnerable application and hack it. Okay. So we're going to demonstrate that right now. You see my screen here. This is a node application. Uh, we call it's a to do app. Um, let me get it uh, running really quick so that people can see what's going on here. We'll run. I have a Mongo database that stores some of the data for me. And then I have a front end uh, NPM start on that, which will run on localhost 3001, which I have open right here. Let me refresh it to show that it is indeed live. All right. So, very simple, straightforward app. Let's get acquainted with that really quick. It has an input field that lets me create a to do list. So, I need to make sure I brush my teeth. But what's interesting about it is we, in this app, we wanted to enable our users to be able to use Markdown syntax so they could do some styling without having to handwrite HTML code um, because our users don't know how to do that, but they do know how to use Markdown. Let's just, for instance, theoretically here. So if a user wanted to, you know, I really, really need to brush, like really brush your teeth, Brian, because your breath stinks like really bad. So I want to like bold that and that allows me to do that with Markdown syntax. So you get an idea. And then we could do things like links, uh, which are the square brackets. And we could say like, you know, uh, Google or I'd rather, you know what, sneak, right? Let's do sneak. HTTPS uh, sneak.io so that it's secure. And then, then we have a link we can click on now, right? All right. So you're familiar with the app, what it's doing. What's enabling me and, and us to use Markdown is this third-party library. It's called Marked right here on, let me enable screencast mode really quick. So you can see where I'm clicking and all that fun stuff. Uh, and so what Mark does is it allows us to enter in Markdown syntax and convert that to HTML for us. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what it's doing. So I set it up, I require it in my project. And then something to keep in mind here, something interesting is I need to set it up, right? And so setting it up says, I, I set, I'll assign it to a uh, application variable, local variable or setup uh, that's assigned to Marked. But in particular, I went and did my due diligence and I went and checked out to see, hey, what are some options with Markdown that, like, what are the security implications when using marked library and do I need to enable things and turn things on? And it turned out that they have an option to sanitize inputs. And what sanitizing inputs means is it's basically looking for keywords that are known or key characters that are known to be used in a malicious way to try and break things and just completely remove them. So that's what you think about your sanitizing like surfaces, you're cleaning, uh, you know, contaminations off or whatever like that. You're removing it completely. That's what sanitize is about. So it looks like the folks over at Marked, at least with this particular version of Marked that I'm using, which is an older one, intentional, so that's vulnerable, uh, they had security in mind. They wanted to enable this for folks to turn on. Now, something to take note here is unless you're actively looking for something like this, you may not know to turn that on. 
So it's not, it's, it's unfortunate that it's not on by default, which would be ideal for us as developers, because again, unless you're really thinking about it and looking for these types of things, you may not know that that option is there. You may not know that you want to turn that on to keep your users safe, to keep your apps safe as well. So that's something to think about when you're using libraries is like double check the options that they have. What are the security implications with that library and see if they've taken that into account with building it out and what options they offer you. So even though there is this sanitize option to help protect us against the vulnerability with marked and entering markdown into this input field, I'm going to demonstrate to you that we can still actually break it and, and do what's called a cross-site scripting attack. Or, excuse me. So one thing to help me with that is we're going to try to, again, we have our hacker hats on. We know that we can enter in links with markdown using that square brackets and parentheses syntax, right? So let's do a test. And let's see if you know we can enter in some JavaScript to run and get that to execute within the context of this application. So I'm going to enter in an HTML tag of script, right? And then just see if I can run the alert function, which will show a browser alert. And I'm going to close that tag. And then I'll hit Enter. And we could see it didn't quite do that. Alert didn't show up. There is kind of a link to click on. But if I click on that, it just gives me an error. It's not something that's valid. So what's happening is that sanitization logic is recognizing that I'm trying to enter a script, uh, HTML script tag, and have some type of JavaScript run, and it's breaking that apart so that it doesn't actually get executed. So I know now as an attacker, I'm like, okay, so they're doing something to stop this. What else can I try? Well, there's another way we can do enter JavaScript into a link is using the JavaScript keyword and colon, and then try to do the alert that way and see what happens when we do that. Okay, so we get a different result, which is good. So like good from attacker's perspective because it's sense that, all right, there's different things going on depending on what I enter here and the approach I take, but it's not quite working just yet either. So then I might look up and I think about well, what is the typical way that web development or front-end web developers will allow and enable people to enter in markdown syntax like this. And I might go and look up the marked library up on NPM and see if there's any known vulnerabilities in it, or just look at the source code because it's open source. So let's take a look at the source code and get a better understanding of that as a hacker. So I have it open here. And if I look for uh, that's the one that's entering and rendering links on line 869 here, we can see the logic that's behind sanitizing this. So again, keep in mind, it's if sanitization has been enabled through the options of marked. Um, and then it's going to decode a URI using unescaped input. And then it'll replace, do some regex there, which replaces like a word or something like that with the colon there. So it's, it's specifically looking for that colon again. And it does that globally. I'm not that great at regex, but I kind of understand what's going on there. And then there's also this other just if statement. It's like looking specifically for JavaScript and colon, right? Or VB script and colon. So now I know as a, as a hacker, like if I can maybe circumvent that so that I have it still work, but it doesn't quite match that perfectly, as we can see here, that it's like equals triple equals zero, maybe I can bypass this. So if we go back over to the, the browser here and I do test, let's say uh, three, and I say JavaScript, and uh, knowing that it's doing URI encode or HTML encoding, I can find the, I can use the encoded value of a colon character and try and do that to bypass that. So if, I believe if I recall correctly, it's ampersand uh, pound 58 semicolon is the, the encoded version of a colon. And then I can be like, okay, let's try and do alert and one and then close that out. No, that quite still didn't quite work. So as you can see, as a, an attacker, they're going to iterate on this, keep going. We're going to jump ahead a little bit and I'm going to just do the exact exploit uh, that works, the input that will work for sure. I have it saved here, so I don't have to manually type it out, but we'll talk through what's going on here so that you can understand what's happening. So again, it's a link. The link text is gotcha. We're still using that JavaScript key, keyword to indicate that we want to run some JavaScript as part of this link. We are using the encoded version of the colon, but now we're adding another valid JavaScript keyword, which is this. No pun intended. Another keyword could be like uh, that's valid is window, or those of you that are familiar with web development watching right now, or document. Uh, th those are valid keywords that could work in JavaScript. But it also, if you remember, if we go back to the logic of how Mark is doing the sanitization here, it will bypass this for us. 
it will make sure that we don't uh, run into run into this logic and we bypass it and it just gets returned anyway. So to prove that that actually indeed works, I'm going to change this back. Actually, I'll just leave it like that. So now we can see it is a link that works. If I do click it, it does trigger the alert function. And now we have a cross-site scripting vulnerability as part of uh, this application. So that's an example of why a third-party dependency is monitoring and keeping track of third-party dependencies and vulnerabilities are in them and being alerted to these things help us to fix the problem. So what would happen is with a tool, a SCA tool, such as Sneak, which is going to be you know, frequently on a cadence that you choose to scan your application dependencies and alert you and monitor of vulnerabilities that come up, will offer to tell you about, hey, there's this vulnerability in Mark. You need to upgrade to this next version that patches it and then you'll be good to go. So really quick to demonstrate that, how are we doing on time, Kyle? Pretty good? Okay, I think so, at least. Uh, what I would do here is I already know that the, the version that's uh, patched from this or that I need to install is marked at 0 0.3.6. Actually, let me uh, clear my screen so you can see that a bit better and zoom in a little bit. npm install marked at 0 0.3. 3.6. And what that would do is it's going to implement the fix that's there. And then we'll, we'll come back and check that out in a moment to see that uh, I, it no longer has the vulnerability that's available to it. Actually, what I meant to do is show you <laughs> that we can um, see that with Sneak as well. Let me cancel that npm install. We'll go back to the old version. Don't worry, npm. This is just one package. Why is it taking so long? Well, while that's happening, I intentionally disabled the sneak VS Code extension because I didn't want you all to see the vulnerabilities that it calls out to me. Oh boy. Now I'm downloading things, npm installing at the same time. This is risky business, Kyle. Are the demo are the demo gods on my side? And there's vacuuming going on. <laughs> Good timing. I think, I think the the overlords of the demos have definitely blessed you today. It seems like everything's going well. Not to jinx it. Knock on wood. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're good on All time. Right. I think uh, we're pretty good on time. Excellent. So with the sneak uh, extension enabled now, I want to reload VS Code to kind of trigger it to start picking up that. But I also want to let the npm install. So what we'll do is I'm going to pause here. We'll go back to slides and let you keep going. And then we'll come back to this in a moment so that I can show folks uh, that. Also, I know, oh, there, it finished. Never mind. I take that back. We bought us ourselves enough time. All right. So the NPM install finished. Let's reload VS Code here. And again, you typically wouldn't have to do this. I intentionally disabled the extension and re-enabled it. And sometimes with VS Code, you need to like reload VS Code so things start getting triggered and analyzed a bit better. Um, and so with sneak enabled now, if I look at my open source security, sneak found 87 vulnerabilities. One of them is it's alphabetical order. We got marked here, right? And there's a bunch of them actually in marked and sneak the extension directly in my editor so that I could stay within the same context. I don't have to switch to some other browser or some other app to learn about all this. It's alerting me that in this version that I'm using, there's this vulnerability, cross-site scripting vulnerability. I can find out more details on the specifics of it, but really, I just care about upgrading to the next version. So uh, that's all well and dandy. Now, if I do npm install the, the better version that has got the fix, uh, 0.3.6, maybe that'll go a little bit quicker since it's cached. Yes, it is. We can see this should refresh. It will. It might just take a second. But in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the app again and go over the browser to show you, to prove that that, that version did indeed resolve the issue. And let's refresh the browser here. And you can see when I refreshed it, what Mark ends up doing now is it, it just completely removed that bad one. But to show that uh, it is still indeed working as well, let's try and enter it again. Let's copy that line and paste it in and you can see it just completely doesn't let any of it get rendered there's nothing to click into here and now we've you know 
mitigated the risk of that cross-site scripting vulnerability in the latest version of the package we're depending upon. And that does it for that example. So I hope that helps hit home a little bit more to give you an idea of these are the things that you're trying to defend against as a developer so that you can at least have a better understanding of why instead of just being told, hey, you have to do this kind of thing, right? All right, we can switch back over to slides now. Producer in the back. Perfect. And Kyle is going to talk to you about another. So we talked about software composition analysis, which is really what is the code that you're depending upon that you need to be monitoring and analyzing for security vulnerabilities. And that's for Sneak, that's called Sneak Open Source. Um, Kyle, you can take it away from here. Awesome. So yeah, I think um, basically the idea of what Brian's showing us is like how easy it is to automate, you know, these updates. Um, if you think about it, he didn't leave his um, he didn't leave his IDE at any point in time, right? And he was able, I mean, except when you know we went to the local host site, but he didn't leave his IDE at all to go and find out about the vulnerability or to remediate the vulnerability, right? Like he basically had, um, you know, this is uh, the GitHub equivalent, right? So. He could have just gone to GitHub. He could have seen that there was a PR right already for this package. If he if he had this package up in GitHub and he was like, you know, maintaining it like a normal package, right? And this wasn't a demo, and it was up in GitHub. You know, you could use Sneak Open Source, which is free by the way, and um, automatically, you know, uh, detect and update packages. So um, that is included in free tier, and you know, we do uh, work and partner with a lot of folks to make sure that that is um, up to snuff here. So. And um, automated remediation, automated packing, uh, package, uh, pack, excuse me, automated package patching. Geez, try saying that five times fast. Um, you know, yep. it's just really, really awesome, right, Brian? Like single click pull requests, right? Single click fixes. You can fix a ton of vulnerabilities with basically one click. Um, and basically, you know, we apply half a million patches every month uh, through this method, right? Uh, just as a company. So we also wanted to plug this list here. This is a community source list, including a lot of open source solutions for software composition analysis. And if you're, you know, you're on a shoestring budget and you need something integrated, you know, Sneak's free. There are options here that are free. Um, Sneak just happens to do basically all of the things that, you know, we think developers want, right? They want JavaScript, they want Java, Python, Go, right? You don't want to use um, a ton of different systems for everything you could possibly think of. And you don't want to have a ton of interfaces that developers are clicking into, right? Like you want to keep it all in one platform. You don't want, developers don't want to be clicking around in a browser. They want to be in uh, VS Code or Vim. So, you know, it's like a penny saved is a penny earned, right? Like don't, you know, it's expensive to send developers back and forth through platforms and have them OAuth log into this platform for, you know, Ska, and then have them OAuth log into this platform for SAS, right? Put it all in the same place. And really quick, now we're, oh, one, yeah. one thing to note with that last slide is uh, that that also, like while we we highlighted certain programming languages and ecosystems, it's not necessarily comprehensive for, it's just kind of highlighting the tools that were uh, shared in that the awesome list, which are, are beneficial and, and useful. Um, but there's also other ones, like depending on what your, your shop, your company, your team is using, there are other ones that might be supported, other tools that might be out there to help support that language and ecosystem as well. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention really quick, and I'm sorry to interrupt you again there, Kyle, um, is the demonstration I showed was the tool kind of showing a direct dependency, but having a SCA tool that helps you with those transitive dependencies too, right? Alerting you of, or the you know child dependencies of your dependencies, alerting you and monitoring those things and letting you know, hey, if you upgrade to this, or having the tool that will, uh, you know, over time, sometimes, especially with open source, things take time to get actually merged in, like a patch to come out. So what what you might want to look for in a tool is something that can help you like do a temporary patch uh, in the meantime that you can run and use in your application until the official library pushes out that upgraded version. Um, and there's some tools that can help you with that as well. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I think um, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we really, in hindsight, could have had another column for uh, transitive dependency support. Because um, yeah, only some tools do that, and it seems to be few and far between. But yeah, you know, it's all about the intel. It's all about you know, we we have a vuln DB that's been curated and like very thoroughly like combed through. So yeah, I think that definitely does make a world of a difference when it comes to false positives. You know, and like you know, being proactive and stuff like that. So um, thanks for that, Brian. I think that was a very welcome addition. So um, Sneak Code is the name of our oops, excuse me. Sneak Code is the name of our uh, SaaS tool, and this is actually one of our newest offerings. 
So it works the same way as our other offerings. You see it right here in the ID. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on SAS, but basically we talked about SAS. SAS is you know scanning the code that your developers are writing. And obviously, um, since developers are writing it, we want it to be developer friendly, right? So we reimagined the SaaS industry as a developer first solution. And um, this is what we came up with. I think it's pretty cool. I've implemented a ton of SaaS solutions. I'm not going to name them here, but I've implemented all the big ones that you can probably find by Googling and, um, you know, different shops, different folks, you know, and, and um, I think if we had sneak at any of those places, it would have been a lot easier. And um, I would have had to do less work and our DevOps engineers would have had to do less work. We wouldn't have been hosting, you know, our SaaS and SCOS solutions ourselves in-house on-prem um, if we had Sneak. And yeah, I think it's really just a game changer. Like the code flow stuff's pretty accurate. And, you know, I was a developer, I was a full stack engineer. So like, I kind of know what I'm talking about sometimes. But um, yeah, we're going to go on to containers because I don't want to spend too much time on SAS. And, uh, you know, there aren't really a lot of free open source solutions. So I don't really have anything like awesome to share in that regard, you know, if you're trying to bootstrap it. But um, yeah, I think we're going to move on to containers. Brian, are you ready? Yep, ready. All right, let's hit it. All right, so we demonstrated as an application developer that we need to worry about the, out, the code that we didn't write, but we're depending upon, right? And that's where we're talking about open source code, if you think of it as an iceberg. But then another layer within that that helps that consist of our overall uh, projects and systems that we have are containers to help us because, I mean, containers are welcomed uh, change in the development uh, ecosystem in general because no longer can we I mean maybe they're not welcome because some developers probably really enjoyed saying it works on my machine I don't know why it doesn't work on the deployed environment or somebody else's machine right so maybe there's some developers that aren't happy about it but I'm certainly happy about it to know that we can have a high level of confidence that if the code runs on our machine within that container within that type of you know isolated environment then using that same specifications on creating that environment it will run in another area, another place that it's deployed to. So that's the benefit, right, at a high level, very generally speaking of containers from a developer perspective. But with that, it introduces, yet again, another area that we should be concerned about for security, or security posture, if you will. So if you look at this typical, you know, just very straightforward uh, sample Docker file here for, uh, again, like this node application I'm, I'm using here, uh, you define what base image you want to use, right? And when we do that, we're pulling that in from another registry, typically. Maybe it's your own registry that's a, a version of an image, or maybe it's the public registry. Neither way, like what, what dependency, what vulnerabilities might be lying within that base image, right? Uh, from there, maybe you have some tooling that you need to leverage inside of that, that container, right? And you install using the, the native ecosystem of that oper underlying operating system to install that. In this case, we're installing an image magic tool that's going to help with like image uh, manipulation, resizing, cropping, whatever it may be, right? You're doing some image processing. Uh, what vulnerabilities might be found within that tool, right? And how do you keep track of that? And then from there, you have, again, the M your NPM installing, you're depending on, you have dependencies that are for your app. We, we already talked about that, but that's also introduced as part of this definition, the Docker file. And if you could go one, one or two more, um, uh, one more from there and then again going back to that base image what about the runtime right so typically your base image is defining the runtime for your programming language that you need so in this case i need node does that version of node of that base image have any vulnerabilities in it that i need to be worried about and how do i keep track of that and uh through some again a research and study that was done by sneak we found that even with uh, just very similar to the package ecosystems or library ecosystems for our programming languages, the container images that are used for this part of the process of our projects also have a significant number of vulnerabilities that are reported in it year over year, time over time. So as you can see here, it gives you an idea between 2018 and 2019, the number of vulnerabilities that were disclosed uh, for the varying types of typical uh, container images that folks would be using in our, in our industry. Next slide, please. Ooh. Um, and then, as we've been kind of, uh, you know, the theme throughout the the talk today is that a lot of a lot of security folks, the security teams at your companies are trying to help and integrate developer teams into the process of keeping security in mind. With that comes a lot more ownership for developers, right? And in that case, the same thing, just like ownership of our dependencies, there's ownership of these container images that we're using. And through this uh, survey that was done, we can see that. A lot of 68% uh, to be exact were reporting that the developers were the owners of that process of choosing 
the images that are used for their applications because I mean it kind of makes sense, right? You you know best of what images you need to run your application to help support your application. Yeah, I think that's um a pretty good point. You know, we, we're definitely seeing the shift left as far as container and development goes. And um, you know, we see ops coming in strong at number two, you know, DevOps folks, right? Um as far as uh, where you want to delineate how how different DevOps is from development, you know, they're still writing logic at the end of the day. So I think that's a pretty good point, Brian. For sure, for sure. And then, um, so the same kind of process that we need to keep in mind when it comes to worrying about the security of our direct dependencies of our application, we need to do the same, try to implement the same processes or work towards having the same process for our containers. So we want to make sure that we have something to help us with detecting and, be, and being having an understanding of what vulnerabilities are found in the dependencies that we have in our containers. We want to be able to have an understanding of what it takes to remediate or fix the problems, resolve and get to a safe version of things uh, when those problems are alerted and then continuously monitoring for more future ones. So maybe you have a certain set of dependencies right now, but then you introduce new ones and what vulnerabilities might come into play with that. That's why active monitoring will help you and continuously monitoring will help you stay on top of those types of things. And the next slide. All right, IAC, Kyle. Yep. So we are going to talk about infrastructure as code. You know, we've kind of talked about all these other points here. And I think IAC is kind of, you know, the pipes that, you know, puts the plumbing together, so to speak. And there are lots of Kubernetes config files publicly accessible on GitHub. People have seen this as a great attack vector, right? And um, actually, IAC misconfiguration is becoming increasingly popular. Um, there's some great stats from OWASP. Also, the NSA and the CISA have um, released some advisories, actually, on Kubernetes hardening. So, like, actual guides for, like, hardening your Kubernetes instance from, like, you know, the uh, Department of Defense and, you know, CISA and NSA. So, I would totally, totally recommend checking out those resources. They're super nice and, um, you know, it's all free. So, why are people attacking this? Well, you know, sometimes people set up production images or production instances and they could run for a really, really long time, like years, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes sometimes they update them, sometimes they don't, right? Sometimes you have something and it's like literally running for, you know, 300 days. And how are you going to protect that, right? How are you, like, if a developer pushes something out and they're like, well, I'm done, you know, they, they uh, clean their hands and they're like, that's it. Um, how are you going to monitor that over time? Like, you know, will there be container drift? Um, will, you know, some stuff change, right? Will vulnerabilities have new things released? Will there be a new CVE, right? So um, I think this, you know, it, it was a big wake-up call for people last Friday um, that, you know, they don't really know exactly, like, you know, the software, you know, bill of materials in their production instances or in their repos. Um, I think, you know, Friday was kind of a, a rude awakening for some folks, right? But if you're using a program like Sneak or you're using a, you know, um, IAC monitoring service or IAC drift monitoring, right, you can probably see folks doing weird stuff, folks doing weird inclusions. Um, you can see the vulnerabilities, right? Um, so, yeah, depending on how you're monitoring, right, obviously we're focusing here on dependencies and, you know, uh, CVEs coming out and basically, um, you know, containers with misconfigurations and things like that and uh, IAC misconfigurations. So we're monitoring for new vulnerabilities. We're monitoring for misconfigurations, right? And any any sort of drift. So I think that's how you can protect yourself against a lot of these like misconfig attacks. Like just be diligent and have adequate uh, monitoring in place. You know, things are going to change. Um, software always changes. So just make sure that you're prepared for, you know, the next CVE or something by like monitoring your production images, right? See what happens to them, and uh, you know, just pay a lot of attention to it over time. So. It's great to automate all that, right? And that's kind of kind of the point of what we were showing. You can automate it just like you'd automate anything else in Sneak. You can sort of just like um, automatically receive those notifications, go in there, fix them. You know, you'll you'll have all that feedback on the Sneak platform. So everything we've been talking about, you know, we're focusing on making it developer first. Like it is from the ground up. That's how we've designed it. You know, that's our whole mission is to make developer first, uh, developer centric security tooling. So if you do Sneak container test and then you know nothing else, and you're in a repo that's uh, you know a container. It will just run. If you do sneak test and you're in a you're in a repo that has a manifest, it'll just run. So it's really you know the bar barrier to entry is like super low. And here you can see um, you know basically a vulnerability introduced by a version of uh, ZTZip. So that is definitely something that you'd want to know as you're developing code. 
so how are we going to detect all this stuff? Well, you got to detect it, like I said at the beginning, as early as possible, right? As early and as soon as possible. You got to scan as frequently as possible. You want to scan everything. So how can you do that? Well, you can do it locally, right? You can do it locally in your tools. You can do it in your CLI. You can do it in your IDE. And, um, you know, that's that's really uh, doing it in the CLI is a big perk for me because I'm a Vim guy. So I don't like leaving my terminal. And you got Git here. You have GitLab. You have Bitbucket, right? Like we can work with just about anything. We integrate with just about everything, CICD tools, you know, registry tools. And then obviously when you get to production, you know, we want to monitor those Kubernetes instances and make sure that they're adequately hardened. So hey, detect Kyle, it. Yeah. I, I hear you're a Vim guy. To okay. be honest, I'm a VS Code guy. I'm envious of, of being able to use Vim, but you'll be proud of me. I know how to exit Vim at least. I think Randall and I will set you up with NeoVim and I think you'd love it. We'll, okay, we'll cool. have to nerd out one day. All right. We'll do a little IDE makeover. <laughs> So uh, maybe, you know, you weren't convinced at the beginning. You thought that this would be expensive. You thought it would be hard. You thought it would be, you know, it wouldn't be automatic, right? Like, how are you going to automate security? Well, hopefully you believe me now. I've done this at a couple places. You know, not, not to like toot my own horn or anything, but I've done this at a couple places. It is really, really hard if you're using a ton of different tools, right? I used a different SAS, SCA, and DAS tool, at a place with like very, very high security requirements. And it was a nightmare. So, um, it, um, you know, I'm no stretch or anything, you know, but basically, you know, use, use whatever works for you. If you only need, you know, one language or, you know, one system, you know, use something that works for you. If you're only trying to, you know, check for, for SCA packages, maybe you sneak open source, right? You're just trying to check for package dependencies, right? That's very easy, automatic solution, easy to integrate into things. But, um, maybe you believe me, but you don't know how to sell this to your org, right? So like, what are you going to do? Well, show them this graph. Show them some numbers and figures. There are lots of figures out there done by the industry. Um, you know, just research white papers done by the industry. And it shows that as we get to production, right, this should be obvious for, you know, everyone who's a developer, you already know this. I'm just preaching to the choir here. But if you catch it at design phase, when you're talking to security people, if you invite security people into the room while you're doing feature planning, like you're going to get a ton of vulnerabilities. You're going to poke holes in your feature. Like think about the security implications of your feature. Ask the security experts about the security implications of your feature and then go based off of that. This is where you stop, um, you know, vulnerabilities early before you've done any development work, before you're depending on any libraries, all that stuff, right? So and then you get to coding, right? You're probably going to have to run SCA and SAS, get to QA, you know, probably running SAS again on these commits, on these builds and, um, you know, unit testing too, right? So if you're catching stuff, you know, maybe you're catching stuff here, right? Wouldn't it be great if you caught stuff earlier, right? And then when you get to integration testing and you're testing it with your real systems and then when you're actually, you know, pushing it out and it's in production, right? When, you know, it's 15 to 90 times higher than at design and coding. So that's how you can sell it to folks. When you are, you know, fixing something during integrations and systems test, when you're about to deploy and then you're finding security issues, which like, let's face it, if you don't have all the stuff in place, that's probably what's happening. Um, you're probably finding it afterwards. Somebody's reporting it, bug bounty program, it's already in production. You got to re, you got to decouple things. You got to go, you basically got to go back. You got to throw away a ton of dev work, right? And um, that is um, directly equatable to dollars. So if you need a way to sell this to somebody, I offer you this tool. This is how I had to do it. And, um, you know, it really, really helped. So yeah, detect vulnerabilities everywhere. You know, it's cheaper to fix them earlier. So just like make sure you at least have SCA, you know, sneak SCA, sneak open source or any other SCA, you know, solution in place. And remember to develop fast and stay secure. So, um, you know, we're here to help you. If you have any questions about SAS, SCA, you know, I'm, I also know about a little bit about DAST, IAC, container um, scanning, uh, happy to help. You know, feel free to reach out to me on uh, Twitter right there. And uh, Brian, any, any closing words, any closing remarks for the crowd? Yeah, just that uh, when we say sell, we mean like sell ownership and the 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 idea of keeping security, the idea of security, right? And and having that top of mind as part of your overall process, right? We don't yep. I just want to make sure in case people might be misunderstanding. We're not saying like sell, uh, you know, a, a product or anything. We're saying sell to your leadership that it's important and you should incorporate it in your overall development processes, your software development lifecycle, right? Make it as important as developing those features because if you don't have security at that level of prioritization then just the features are the only thing they're prioritized and you're leaving your yourself your users your business at risk of vulnerabilities that could cost you money once you're in production as kyle was showing through that graph there right so that's totally. the idea and then you you all you know when you're when that's already bought in now everybody's on the same page evaluate look at you know we're talking about sneak here but evaluate the tools check them all out see which one best fits your needs uh, you know, obviously Kyle and I believe that sneak is most likely going to be the top one for you there. We, otherwise we wouldn't be here kind of thing. 
but really, you know, shoot, evaluate them, do your own research on it and see which one fits well within the processes that you define with your teams and organization. Totally agree with that. There's no, there's no point in being dogmatic over a tool. I'm obviously, you know, I came over here from, you know, a uh, basically, you know, social media startup, very, very, very popular one. And, um, you know, we use Sneak and um, I used Sneak before when I was doing bug bounty hunting and I used Sneak before for my own open source projects. And, um, you know, I just used Sneak after I fingerprinted a service, I used Sneak to look up it in VulnDB and figure out, you know, like free, free open source, figure out, you know, what vulnerabilities were in these packages, you know, that I was attacking for these bug bounty programs and these like CTF competitions. And it helped me a lot. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually in a believer, a big believer in what we've do I've used all the other uh, guys? I've used Bridge Crew. I've used Chekhov. I've used you know um, the the other vendors, right? They some of them have good open source offerings. You know, some of them really don't. So I think um, one thing that's really cool is just you know you can get started with the SCA for free, um, and you don't need to install anything besides for you know like a, a Pi package, Pi Pi package to get started, or an npm package, and you just run it and you're good to go. So, um, you know, it's sort of, it's certainly made my life easier. Um, and I think, yeah, does anything, no matter what you choose, a wasp dependency check or track, like you're going to have, um, you know, basically a very good idea of what you're shipping out there. So, um, don't sell sneak to your folks, sell the idea of dev sec ops and security automation to your folks. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely guys. Uh, amazing presentation. Uh, it's such a huge topic, but it's uh, really a uh, very cool and, and, and streamlined overview that you have delivered. So thank you very much for that. And I only can recommend to everyone uh, like to get familiar with the topic, to get familiar with DevSecOff, the, the shift to the left. Um, and uh, yeah, also uh, really I can only recommend to uh, follow these guys on Twitter. Uh, Brian is a content producer, I think, also besides just going to these kind of virtual conferences. I think you have a, a podcast or a YouTube channel or something. Yeah, I stream live on Twitch doing programming and things of, of that nature where I'm just learning in front of an audience all the time and making mistakes. So if you like, you know, supplementing your education of not seeing a scripted thing go from one path to a happy path and, uh, you know, tune in sometime. Hope to see you there. It's That's really cool. cool. And also, if you're not familiar with FleetSpeak, then you maybe uh, need kind of a bit of time to get the handle of uh, Kyle, but uh, I'm sure you can manage it. <laughs> it's, um, it's a test. Uh, so, Guys, we're a bit over time, but I would love to take some questions from the audience. So if you're fine, then, then uh, we would uh, jump right into that. Uh, sure. First question to break the ice. There was one uh, one. Um, I'm not sure who asked, but someone was asking, ah, Jeremy was asking about what VS Code team do you use, Brian? Well, uh, that's always the, the question. The I'm using, question I, always the first question. Kind of we as developers love to know what themes people are using. So I'm using uh, the a Night Owl theme by Sarah Dresner. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, Kyle, unfortunately, nobody asked about a Veeam team that you usually use. <laughs> You know, uh, I'll definitely post my Vim RC for you guys. I know somebody out there is interested. So. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> somebody commented that Vim is cool, actually. Awesome. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having us on, by the way. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So um, a technical question uh, from... Um, let me see what, what we pick first. There's so many questions. Um, yeah, Christian is asking, does Sneak scan for cross-site requests? Yeah, CSRFs. We do um, scan for CSRFs both in Sneak SCA and um, Sneak SAS, like Sneak code. So our SAS solution, okay, so like if you if we detect a package that might have um, server-side request forgery on it, or, um, you know, cross-site request forgery, then what we usually do, if they have SAST as well, is we're able to detect whether the vulnerability is actually reachable. So is the vulnerable functionality implemented or does the package just have, you know, this potential mm -hmm. for exploitation or, you know, this vulnerability packaged in it? But it's a, a whole other story as to whether you're actually utilizing the vulnerable functionality. So we try to make a really um, good story of that by, you know, you know, first doing the SCA and then doing the SAS to see if the business logic is actually susceptible to this. And, you know, we call that vulnerability reachability. So yeah, I think that's a great question. It's something that we're continuously working on and adding more things to our list. But CSRF and SSRF, I do know are both close. Like they're both mm -hmm. reachable uh, vulns in the platform. Okay, thank you. And thanks also for the question, Christian. Then next question, uh, Miro, interesting one because it's actually right, uh, quite actual. Uh, what, uh, what, would something like the log4j case be intercepted by Sneak? 
Yeah, so, I mean, obviously not as a zero day, like not if it hasn't been reported and disclosed, you know, we really do lean on the community, like we we aggregate all these vulnerability platforms, you know, we work with a ton of community partners. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't know before anyone else, you know, that's not like we knew when it happened Thursday, Thursday night, our time, right? Mm -hmm. But um, Thursday night, our time, you know, as soon as uh, everybody was um you know the as soon as it started to like bubble up you know like we it came on our radar you know we do have folks who are looking out for things like that and you know mm -hmm. our uh, research team and our r d team are like really on top of that stuff mm -hmm. so we were able to like sort of come out ahead of it and inform our clients like asap thursday night you know friday morning for some of them and um yeah i think uh to answer that question like yes and no right like as soon as it comes out and as soon as other people know about it like we're definitely adding it yeah. and um but Did you get it then it? basically faster solved than without, like uh, better you have it than you don't have it, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so as soon as it's there, we throw it up. As you said, like you're doing a lot of research and uh, people are contributing. And so there's also one question regarding that uh, from Sven, uh, like, do you scan and patch all the packages yourself or is there a way to contribute? Oh, like the sneak? patch yeah. packages? Um... No, I think it is related to, to um, third-party packages but anyways like I'll... yeah you're asking like if our team makes prs for like these open source projects is that the question no i think i, I think mean so. you can also uh make your question more concrete but uh, the question is do you scan and patch all the packages yourself or is there a way to contribute i think it was like as you mentioned now for the log 4j so obviously someone uh, is kind of military and reported it so so do people report directly to you or do you have a team that basically as you said like does the research and so on how, how does that work yeah a little bit of both i'd say like people sometimes we get customers and they'll come up to us and they'll ask like hey can you can you add this right like i noticed this isn't in there so mm -hmm. um you know that does happen but yeah usually we're on top of it as soon as something comes out you know we sort of bring it in and aggregate it but um as as far as us making prs like um you know open source packages if that is the intent of the, the question um mm -hmm. i i don't think that's something that we do right now i think maybe you know we do collaborate with maintainers we let maintainers mm -hmm. know before we publish research right we always okay. always work with the maintainers if we can and we let them know like what's happening you know like if we can we'll give them remediation remediative guidance but we we try to keep it really close working with the open source community you know we try to do right by everyone that we can so um, I, I don't know if we're exactly making PRs, but when our researchers, you know, who are out there, you know, hardcore, just looking for new um, vulnerabilities, attack vectors, you know, evaluating attack surfaces of, you know, things that come up like this. Um, yeah, they always try to, you know, if we find something new, find something novel or find something scary, we do try to push mm -hmm. it um, over to the maintainers in a responsible fashion so that they have some time to respond and react. Well, that's good. Thanks for answer. Uh, Federico is asking a question to Brian. What's your Twitch uh, channel? name uh, it's uh clarkio without the underscore at the beginning thank, thank wow. you everybody okay. for your interest <laughs> perfect so um let me see what else do we have here um uh Sviol is asking can you sneak together with podman kyle do you know that one i, I... I don't think i know podman spot manager podman oh that's like the docker replacement right yeah it's like let me let me find out for the, you. Yes. But <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna look around and I'll see. But I don't. I, my first. Oh, actually, it looks like we do. Nice. Okay. It looks. Like I hadn't we heard do. of Podman, so it's another container solution. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, let me take a look. Uh, okay, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, yeah. but I'm sure like when you someone can find the answer on Google or you just uh, yeah, uh, maybe can tweet the answer or Yeah, I'll like see that. I'll see if we can tweet something. Um if yeah. if we do support it, I'll make sure that we throw a tweet out about it. So that, if we don't see a tweet about Podman, that's that probably would the be, that would be great. <laughs> um and there have been some questions that you actually answered in the during the presentation questions early in the in the in the in the presentation, like uh, does it run on the cloud and so on? Obviously yes. Um uh, then uh, how to report and so on. We discussed that. Ah, that's an interesting question, not so technical from Dario. How do you make people inside the organization aware of um, this topic? Because obviously, like, where to start? Um, if you know where to start, how to advocate for it? Um, you need kind of a buy-in from the management or from the team. People need to use it together and so on. How, 
what's your take on that? Oh, that's a great question. Brian, you want to go first or should I take this one? Sure, I'll go first. So from my perspective, uh, like I had done this in a previous role where one, I just naturally like what, if you have an interest in security, that's good. Run with that, basically run with that passion and learn as much as you can. And as you learn, if you have like helping level up your your teammates, their knowledge in that space as well, doing, you know, like a lunch and learn type of thing, or if you have an internal conference at your company, helping raise awareness, kind of doing advocacy, which is kind of what, what Kyle and I are doing here, but internally, like internal advocacy at your company. That will help one establish you as like an, you know some a knowledgeable figure mm. in your company for security for one, and then people will trust your opinion and thoughts more on that. So that way, when because managers and other internal people leadership are attending those things, they'll learn about that as well, and that will help buy them in. Uh, in terms of helping developers really buy in, I think it's like like I was doing today. I truly believe because it clicked for me showing, mm. and a lot of times the security teams don't want to show how to hack us uh, like how a hack works because they're mm -hmm. worried about the developers doing that against them. But really, like, if you don't know what you're defending against, yeah. you're not going to think it's important. So that's my two cents. But Kyle, go ahead. And, and... That's actually good, because when you say showing, I think it's really about that, making them aware that there is something that is vulnerable. Because usually, otherwise, you would learn maybe at, you know, at the point when it's really um, not good for you, when, when there is a breach or something. So. So I think that's that, that's better to have as an internal kind of uh, uh, test. Yes, don't hack your systems without permission, though. Like use like we have sample apps. Like you can go to the Sneak Labs uh, GitHub repository. That, that's the app I was using today. It's called the Goof app. Mm. That is intentionally yeah, vulnerable to, know. to do. Yeah, that's good to know. Okay, Fox, do you have anything to add? We are way over time, but it was super interesting to to see the presentation, both of your answers. So any anything at the end you want to add? Yeah, just like to throw in because like I, I had the same issue, you know, getting buy in, right? And like mm -hmm. getting people to prioritize like security mm -hmm. and like these tools, right? Um, look at security champions programs, right? You can scale out the effect, you know, if you're one developer, you can really scale out the effect of being like security oriented by like Brian said, teaching and enabling other folks. Mm -hmm. So um, if you get a security champions program, right? And um, look up security champions program sneak, we have white papers, articles and videos on it. I'll be making more content around that. So like reach out to me if you have anything that you want to see that we don't already have. But um, yeah, basically, you can build a world class security champions program with like zero dollars just like get people together one hour a month you know first 30 minutes talk about the news in security next 30 mm -hmm. minutes do like a pragmatic exercise maybe try hack me hacks the hack the box you know skill people up and then give them stuff that they can take away and do on their own time you know give them some follow-up material ref, uh, resources from that lesson and um that's what i did you know we took the organic security community from our com uh, our company from three people to 80 people you know which is half the development team in just three to four months so you can do it too. If you need to know how, reach out to me. I will happily give you some pointers. But yeah, um, you know, show them, show them the cost and the figures, right? Show them that last slide I showed you with the with the trend. Like, you know, that is accurate. Fifty to ninety percent more hmm. per um, you know, when something could be caught at design and it's caught at production. You know, depending on how intrinsic that is to your systems, you know, it could be a nightmare. So um, you know, it's better to come out ahead of these things. It's better to have folks, you know, come in a room once a month. Architects, you know, engineers, whoever's interested, you know, volunteer them and then. You know, try to get a representative from each agile team and um you know bring them all together just talk you know casual talk bring some snacks pizza you know <laughs> i used to make cold brew and just you know people will look forward to it people will want to come and people will start thinking about security if you're excited and you're passionate about it and you're you know holding these security champions meetings and like you know maybe uh, have folks talk about security problems the company has faced how you'd combat them now are you prepared for them now and just like you know have a place for those difficult conversations where people feel like they can actually you know bring everything they have to contribute yeah, absolutely. So with uh, that, I would like to say thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much, Kyle. You have been wonderful uh, guests. I hope to see you each next year again.